now everybody say praise the lord you happy to be in the house of the lord today it's so good to see you here now folks are gathering in and uh the seasons are changing but let's lift our hands one more time and tell the lord we didn't come to worry about any of it we came to praise your name lord that's what we're here for is to magnify your name hallelujah praise god now you can be seated we have some things we want to uh, to mention here first of all we have a, a recent baptism and uh, we're very excited because antonio is here today and uh, we were hoping to do this we like to do it from the front if we can so antonio elder where where are you are you in the building all right come on come on up we're going to get ready and uh let's give antonio a hand god bless him praise god all right baptized in jesus name september the 20th is that you how do you say this go on keep on Praise the Lord. <laughs> All right. Beautiful. Now, <clears throat> some time ago, uh, the Gudi Gudiel family had a very uh, serious accident when Sophie uh, injured herself very, very, very seriously. It was a very traumatic time. And uh, we've been praying for some many weeks now for God to continue to touch her and heal her but today we have a wonderful miracle that thrills our heart because sophie is in the building where is she she's made it to church today praise god and along with her and her family uh we have a, a one of the paramedics that was there at the accident and uh, was part of saving her life uh, Jordan Embry. Where is Jordan? I saw her. All right. Let's give Jordan. All right. Thank you, Jordan. There she is. Hallelujah. And I understand that some of the others, uh, Charlie Hunt was another, and he is uh, watching, or ho hopefully was able to get on the live stream and is watching the service on the live stream. And also we want to give a shout out to Captain Lisa Cowles, who was such a big part of it. Could we give them all a big hand? <laughs> we are so thankful. Hallelujah. Amen. God is still answering prayer. Hallelujah. In just a moment, you can be seated. In just a moment, we're going we're gonna to pray. But uh, we need to mention a few things, uh, get our announcements out of the way. Uh, and, and make sure we know what they are. Um, <clears throat> uh, we also have a guest today, uh, Jarrett Stahl, and so we uh, was baptized some time back, and we we're very happy to have him back in service. And uh, the Lord is moving. Even in these times of COVID and, and, uh, and pandemic, God is still answering prayer and doing a mighty work in His church. And we're believing God. Hallelujah. Now, here are some names that you'll want to remember. Of course, brother and sister uh, Rachel and Nathan are out of town preaching, so keep them in prayer. Brother Yancey has had some uh, serious issues. They've been uh, taking care of. He's much better. He's home and improving, but keep him in prayer. Brother Lucas had a pretty uh, serious surgery, uh, was many hours in surgery, but came out of intensive care last night. And uh, he's doing much better. So let's pray for him. Put him on the top of the prayer list. Sister Thelwell, Sister Ann, uh, Anne Marie's husband, uh, has been diagnosed with cancer. Pretty young fella. So uh, let's pray for him that all this will be brought under control. And Sister Guzman, I don't know. If, yes, Sister Guzman, keep praying for her. God's healing her, touching her body. And she's on the top of our prayer list. So would you stand with us? We're going to uh, do two things. We're going to pray. And then we're going to give. So I know you came prepared and we like to march. So we're going to start each. All the roads will be open at the same time. We have four uh, offering baskets up here. You just march around and then go back this way and go back to your seat. But I want you to recall out the names of these that uh, we have mentioned and pray for them. And let's pray for the offering. Could we bow our heads and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, right now we come in the name of Jesus on behalf of every one of these needs and ask God that you will do a mighty miracle in their lives. We believe that you're the healer of our bodies. Lord, you are the answer to everything.
every problem. You can help us with the mundane or the mighty. And we ask you right now to do it on behalf of your people. Lord, I pray for these that are sick. I thank you because you're the healer that is keeping them. And right now, Lord, we praise you. Lord, as you get ready to anoint the preaching of the word, and I thank you for that. And I ask God that you will bless each and every one today as they give to the kingdom of God and that you will lift them up, Lord, in your presence. And we give you praise. Put your hands together and let's thank God for it in the name of Jesus. All right, as they sing, let's get ready to give. Just come and bring your offerings. God bless the praise team as they come.
you, Jesus. Yes, one more time. Put your hands together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We, uh, we just got word, and I want us to have special prayer for the Flanagans. Brother Flanagan had a very serious heart situation come up. And uh, it's it's very dangerous situation, and uh, and we're not exactly sure what took place, but we're believing that God will take care of it. Would you pray with us right now, just before they sing again? Lift that other hand up and let's tell the Lord, Father, right now we come against this in Jesus' name. We pray for Brother Michael. Pray for your touch and your anointing upon him as we lay hands on him in praise. Hallelujah! We give you praise. Hallelujah. Thank you.
even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. I know they're singing, but I want to introduce you to someone. The Goodyell family is here. I want you to see Sophie walk across here. <laughs> Come on. Come on, let's walk across here, Mom. Okay, here we go. Jesus. 
Jesus. God, you've been our healer. You've been our provider, Jesus. Oh, God, when it seems like there's no way, Jesus, you've made a way, Jesus. You speak into every situation, Jesus. And we trust you, God. You're bigger than any health problems, Jesus. You're bigger than our finances, Jesus. You're bigger than any mountain that could stand before us, Jesus. We love you, God. We thank you, Jesus. There's nobody like you, Jesus. There's none like you, Jesus. You're worthy, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. If you're looking for a miracle in this place, if you need God to move in your situation, lift your hands and worship him. He's bigger than what you're going through. Somebody lift up the name of the Lord this morning. Somebody worship him and give him praise. That's why we're here today. To celebrate the goodness of God. And what a tremendous thrill it is to see Sophie and Donnie and Danilo and Sister Jennifer and the entire Gudiel family, the babies. What a blessing of the Lord. And this is a long time answered prayer. And we know that God is a miracle worker, amen? Even when you don't feel it. Because the goodness of God is more than just a feeling. The blessings of God are more than just feelings. And the miracles of God have nothing to do with our feelings. Because the Bible tells us that our, our heart is deceitfully wicked. In fact, if, if you try to follow your heart, you get in all kinds of trouble because your heart will lie to you all the time. But God is faithful. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he was a healer yesterday. He's a healer today. He was faithful yesterday. He's faithful today. He was good yesterday. He's good today. That's the nature of of our God and so we we celebrate today I feel like the message the Lord has laid on my heart uh, has been right in line with what we've been singing today and that's never planned we don't plan our message with the music it just sometimes the Lord just puts it all together in a way that only he can and so I'd like to direct your attention to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse number 2. And we'll read down to verse number 6. Matthew 11, 2 through 6. Now our text doesn't indicate exactly which John this is, but... We're coming in on the story of John the Baptist at the, at the end of his ministry. In fact, at this point in time, John the Baptist is in prison and Jesus is at the height of his earthly ministry. We probably don't think about this often enough, but right when Jesus was ascending to the height of popularity John was going through his most difficult and darkest hours and so that's the scripture that we come in on verse 2 now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ he sent two of his disciples and said unto them Art thou he that should come, 
or do we look for another? So John sent two of his disciples to go to Jesus and ask Jesus this question. Art thou he that should come? In other words, are you really the Messiah? Or should we be looking for someone else? Verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. I'd like to preach for just a few moments this morning. Go tell John. Go tell John. Would you put your Bibles down and lift up your hands and let's ask the Lord to minister to our hearts, shall we? Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, we felt your touch. We felt the power of the Holy Ghost this morning and we've celebrated and I pray that your word would speak to us today in a way that's powerful, that you would help us, that this would be more than just an ordinary service, but that you would meet with us here and change us and rearrange us, I pray, in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for standing. You can be seated for just a moment. It's easy to feel good about the things of God in the warm upper room after being fed a good meal. It's easy to make promises when the choir is singing and the praise team is, is praising the anointing down. It's easy to feel good about the things of God when the preacher is ministering with faith and anointing. We see this in Peter's life when, when Jesus prophesied that someone was about to betray him. In fact, Judas had just left on his way to betray Jesus. And Jesus prophesied, it's about to happen. Someone right here is going to betray me. And, and Peter said, no, I would never do that. Because there are moments when, when we feel as if we would never, ever doubt God. That we would never let God down. That we could never imagine ourselves falling into pits that others might would fall into. But we know from Scripture that it was just a few short hours later that Peter was denying even knowing who Jesus was. He did it with cursing, and he did it three times. And the scripture says when he heard the rooster crow, that was the reminder. That's what Jesus had said would happen. It dawned on Peter, I have done exactly what Jesus said I was going to do. I denied him. I promised that I wouldn't do it, and yet I did. And the Bible says that he wept bitterly. This was a moment of despair in his life. And if you're here today and you're feeling depressed in spite of the worship that's been taking place, if you're struggling with doubt and fear in spite of the moving of the Holy Ghost that's already been happening in this sanctuary, if you're fighting feelings of discouragement, then you are in good company. I don't know where this idea came from that good Christians never face feelings of discouragement, but wherever it came from, we need to send it back to hell because it's broke and it does not work. The very best can get discouraged. Any of us could wind up fighting discouragement before the sun rises on another day. Discouragement can overtake anybody in this room. Knowing God does not make you immune to feelings of despair. David said, my foot almost slipped when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Elijah called down fire from heaven. And just a few hours later, he was saying, God, why don't you just take my life? Go ahead and just kill me. Lord, I wish I could die. Job 
cursed the very day that he was born. Moses tried one time and then gave up for 40 years until God set a bush on fire and called him back into his service. You are in good company if you have ever felt feelings of discouragement. It doesn't mean that you're not spiritual. It doesn't mean you don't love God. It doesn't mean you're not a good person. It doesn't mean you're not anointed. It doesn't mean that you don't love your brothers and sisters in the Lord. And it certainly doesn't mean that God is done with you or through with you. It doesn't diminish your ability to win the battle. And you're certainly not alone. Any Christian who tells you they've never battled doubt, fear, discouragement, depression, is not telling you the truth. Because even the very best get discouraged. I read the story of, of John the Baptist because it was in this same context where John sent his two disciples to Jesus to ask him a, an amazing question. This is incredible. You have to, you have to be able to picture this, this scene in your mind. John was the one who had been preparing the way for Jesus. In fact, he was related to Jesus. He was his cousin. And in his deepest hour of despair, when he was in prison, he began to wonder and doubt whether or not Jesus really was the Messiah that they had been waiting for. This, this is amazing. And when the disciples of John came to Jesus. Jesus didn't rebuke them. He didn't have negative words to say about John. I, I, I almost think that we, we would understand if Jesus would have paused and perhaps sent a rebuke back to John. I, go tell John that uh, I rebuke him for even thinking this way. He ought to know better. He's, he, he's John the Baptist. He, he's my cousin. He ought to know what's happening here. But Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, he just starts healing people. And he starts unleashing miracles. And he starts preaching the gospel, the good news to the poor. And he turns around to those, those two messengers and says, I want you to go back and tell John everything that you've seen and everything that you've heard. In other words, Jesus was saying, I want you to go back and encourage John in prison. Tell him he has nothing to worry about. Tell him that the plan of God is taking place right now. Encourage John in prison. And then Jesus takes it a step further. He turns around to the crowd who had heard this exchange and he begins to talk about John. And he says this, John is the greatest of the prophets. In the middle of John's doubt and fear and discouragement, Jesus lifts him up and says, I know he might be in a place of despair right now, but don't you forget, he's a man of God. You didn't go out into the wilderness to hear him preach thinking you were going to see a reed shaking in the wind. No, you went out to hear a fiery man of God preach repentance to the poor. And that's exactly what you saw. And I don't care what you've heard right now. He is the greatest of the prophets who has ever walked the face of this earth. Jesus encouraged John and he lifted up John in his moment of frustration. For Jesus to say that John was the greatest of the prophets is amazing. He was saying that John was greater than the fiery Elijah, the powerful Elisha, the eloquent Isaiah, the weeping Jeremiah, the visionary Ezekiel, the great four teller of the future Daniel and yet John was the greatest of all of these with his own hands John baptized Jesus in the river Jordan he saw the heavens open and he saw the very spirit of God descend like a dove he heard the voice of God say this is my beloved
beloved son in whom I am well pleased. John had the awesome responsibility of introducing the Messiah to the world and he did it eloquently. He said, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. What a preacher he must have been. His church wasn't located just south of Atlanta off a busy highway. No, he preached in the wilderness usually down by a river somewhere. He preached the same sermon over and over again. You didn't go to hear John expecting to hear a new sermon. You didn't go to John expecting to get a fresh word from God. No, John preached the same message everywhere he went. Repent, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, the Messiah is among us. Repent, the Messiah is getting ready to change the world. Repent, the Messiah is about to turn the world upside down. Prepare your hearts. The Messiah is among us us get ready be baptized the Messiah is among us he did it over and over again he did it every single day and they came by the thousands to hear him preach and to be baptized all of Jerusalem knew his name and they were touched by his ministry so great was his ministry that years and years later after the death burial and resurrection of Jesus The Apostle Paul came upon a group of men who had never heard of Jesus' teaching, but they were still faithful to John's teaching. That's the kind of preacher that he was. And yet even in his brightest hour, John preached, speaking of Jesus, that he must increase and I must decrease. But it's easy to say things like that. When everybody wants to get involved in your ministry. It's easy to say he must increase and I must decrease when you're the most sought after preacher in town. It's easy to say things like that when the crowds are pressing in and everywhere you go, people gather by the thousands just to get close to you and hear your words. But it's another story when you're sitting in a Roman prison cell. It's a little harder to feel encouraged when your following has dwindled down to just two people and the days have turned into months of suffering. Discouragement can come even to the greatest prophet of all time. If discouragement can come to John, then who are we to think that we will avoid its touch in our own lives? And so John told them, go and ask Jesus, are you really the Messiah or should we wait for another? What he was really asking is, Jesus, has my whole life been wasted on something fake? Or are you actually the real thing? Have I wasted my life, Jesus? It sounds awful to say it out loud, but it's right there on the pages of the Bible. John doubted that Jesus was the Messiah, God with us. He doubted that Jesus was really the lamb that was going to take away the sin of the world. It was this moment of despair. He was the great baptizer, the one who declared, behold, he's the lamb, the one who saw the heavens opened and heard the voice of God. But he was so deep in doubt that he sent messengers to publicly ask Jesus, are you really the one? Discouragement can happen to all of us. I'm preaching to someone today. I'm reaching for someone today who is doubting your entire way of life. You doubt your relationship with God. You may not be in a physical prison cell, but you feel as though you're closed in by discouragement. Perhaps you feel as if you are bound by something mentally that keeps you from being able to trust God the way that you want to. You doubt the beauty of holiness. You doubt the way of righteousness. You wonder, am I really doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Have I really been following the true way? And you wonder, does this make me a bad person? Can I ever get out of this mindset? And I want to remind you the beauty of how Jesus responds.
responded to John's question. Rather than a sharp rebuke, Jesus unleashed a whirlwind of healing. And I want to remind you today that the same Jesus who spoke regarding John that way loves you with the same love and he wants to unleash some miracles in your life that will remind you that he is exactly who he says he is he wants to do a work in your life that will demonstrate to you that he is really who he claims to be and so Jesus looked at those two disciples and said I want you to go back to John and tell him again about all of these things I'd never noticed this before but both gospels that tell this story mention Jesus saying go tell John again this tells me that this was not the first time that John had sent Jesus sent for Jesus with questions regarding whether or not he was in fact the Messiah this wasn't the first time he'd been in despair this wasn't the first time he'd been afraid but Jesus said go tell him one more time that you have seen me perform miracles that you've seen me do signs and wonders and that you've seen the preaching and that I am who I say that I am I want you to understand today that you might be in despair but God is not you might feel weak but God is not weak Weak. You might feel as if your strength is gone, but God's strength is not gone. You might feel as if you're about to give up, but God hasn't given up on you. You might not feel like you can take another step, but God can carry you across the finish line. You might feel like there's no way out of your situation, but God can send a light at the end of the tunnel. You might feel as if you've got to question some things, but God is going to respond to your questions with patience and love and with miracles and signs and wonders Jesus said go and tell John and so I'm here today talking to a John I want to tell you that Jesus is the same yesterday today and forever I came to tell a John who is in the prison of despair right now that Jesus wants to do a miracle on your behalf that Jesus is demonstrating who he is that he's still a healer he's still a way maker he's still a provider he's still a prayer answering God he's still able to part the Red Sea if he did it before he can do it again if he did it before he can do it again hear me John I know you're in depression but don't let depression blind you to the fact that Jesus is still doing miracles that Jesus is still here he's still working and he still has all power don't forget it John Oh, I'm preaching to somebody today. You feel like a loser because you have questions. You feel like God is angry at you because you have questions. And I know when the preacher preaches like this, we don't want to nod too much because we don't want anybody to think he might be preaching to us. But I think we need to hear this this morning. Hey, every once in a while, you've just got to be comfortable with the fact that you're in despair. But you know what you need to do when you're in despair? You need to send something out send a message to Jesus he hears you right now just say Jesus I need you to encourage me hey you don't need a disciple to do it you can talk to him right now Jesus I need you to encourage me you don't have to say it out loud you might feel embarrassed but right where you are you ought to whisper it to Jesus Jesus I need you to encourage me I'm feeling down all I see is darkness all I feel is fear Jesus I need you to encourage me and I'm going to tell you what Jesus will do if you'll just send a message to him he's going to unleash a world wind a whirlwind of miracles a whirlwind of encouragement a whirlwind that says I know you're down right now but this is not the end of your story your life has not been in vain you haven't been following after something fake no your life is a purpose and I've got news for somebody today. The devil wants you to think that your pain has no purpose. 
The devil wants you to think that the trials that you've been through have no purpose at all. But I want you to know every trial you go through has a purpose in the economy of God. And God wants to remind you it may not feel fair to you. It wasn't fair. John was in prison unjustly. But God said there's a purpose to your pain. There's a reason for your trial. Your life has been invested in something that is bigger than even you are. Listen to me, young person. There is nothing greater that you could surrender your life to than the kingdom of God. There is nothing greater that you could give your life to than serving the one true living God. Every trial you go through will be with a purpose. Every pain you have will have a purpose attached to it because you are serving the Lord and you are walking in the anointing of God. God go and tell John go and tell him go remind him God wants me to tell somebody today that if God could heal my body and put a new heart in my body if the doctors could say I don't like to preach this real often because it's so personal but it was just a few years ago that the doctors were saying you're going to have to undergo a fifth open heart surgery the top doctor at Emory University said there's no doubt about it we're going to have to go in replace a valve you already have so much scar tissue that we're not even sure how we're going to get all the way through it I have so much scar tissue from the surgeries I had as a young person that it's hard for them to even get through that tissue and do a normal surgery that would be easy for someone else who had never had an open heart surgery and I was facing that and I'll never forget my parents began to help me pray and and we went to the doctor and we were going for one more pastor remembers it the Lord gave him a dream and but he didn't tell me about the dream until afterwards and we went to that doctor and they were going to do one more x-ray they were going to do one more uh whatever it is where they go in and do the big scan and and they're going to look at it one more time getting ready and set the date for surgery and i'll never forget the doctor came in and said we don't understand how it happened but you don't need to have an operation and i remember sister cole had been praying and i want to go tell john today that if god could heal my body god can heal your body if god could touch me he can touch you if god could take away the need for surgery for me god can do it for you i want to let somebody know today i I don't want to embarrass anybody, but we have a few folks who used to be bound by alcohol and drugs who are in this building right now. We have people who used to be addicted to meth in this building right now. I wish one or two of them would just throw up their hands as a testimony that if God could deliver me, God can deliver you. If I used to be bound, you don't have to be bound. If I used to be held by the grip of addiction and God could save set me free he can do it for you too we have some people in this room I don't want to embarrass them but I think they ought to give God a praise as a testimony they used to be suicidal before they found God they thought about committing suicide every single day some of you even held the gun in your hand and put it in your mouth but God got a hold of you and he gave you a new life he gave you a new song he gave you purpose you ought to give him praise right now as a testimony come on John come on John I know it's dark right now but he's the same Jesus I know Sister Lucas I know sometimes the doctor gives us a bad report but I came to tell somebody that God is the same yesterday today and forever if he healed brother Lucas yesterday he'll raise him up out of the sick bed again come on John I know it's dark right now I know, I know, I know. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. I know sometimes you can't see. Depression has a way of clouding our vision. Have you ever felt like you were in a fog before? I may not be preaching to everybody. If I'm not preaching to you, you need to help me pray for the ones I am preaching to. 
Have you ever felt like you were just in a fog? Have you ever felt, can we just be human beings here? Have you ever prayed? And, and even in your prayer time, you could not feel God? and you feel that desperation I'm preaching to somebody right now I have felt moments in my own prayer life where I was praying and fasting and I could not feel God brother Grady and I asked myself will I ever be able to feel God the way I did when I first received the Holy Ghost will I ever be able to feel God like I did when I first started preaching will I ever feel feel the anointing the way I did when I was just a young preacher who didn't know anything at all. You know, every once in a while, you get so professional in your relationship with God that you can fake like you're feeling him when you don't feel him at all. And that's a dangerous place to be because we need to be able to feel the presence of God. We need to be able to enter into the Shekinah glory of God. And I can tell you that there have been times, this is just me being human, where I have stood up to preach and I did not feel the anointing like I did when I was a young preacher. And I've fallen on my face and said, God, I need to be able to feel you like I used to feel you. I need to be able to experience your power the way I used to experience your power. I'm not content to live without really, really, really being being close to you and I want you to know in those moments I have had long periods of time where God did not respond to me but I'll tell you a personal moment that happened in my life that I remember over and over again it was just a few short years ago I needed somebody you see John had two disciples that were willing to work on his behalf they loved him enough they cared enough about him to make the journey from his prison to Jesus and from Jesus back to John and I remember a dark moment in my life and I was praying and I could not feel God and Bishop Cole found me in an altar he didn't know that I was feeling that way I hadn't told him anything at all but I know that he had been in a prayer room sister Cole and he knew that I was hurting in my spirit and he came up to me in the way that only brother Cole could do and he grabbed my face with both of his hands in the way that only Bishop Cole could do if you remember Bishop you know what I'm talking about he had great big giant hands and he was a tall man and he reached down and grabbed my face and he shook it like that and he kind of scared me a little bit and he said brother Ryan I was praying for you this morning and God wanted me to tell you that God is the same yesterday today and forever and if he kept you yesterday he'll keep you today and if he blessed you yesterday he'll bless you again today he loved you yesterday and he loves you today he anointed you yesterday and he'll anoint you today and big old tears flooded down my face and I felt God the way I used to feel God because it every once in a while you've got to be willing to run to a John and say John Jesus can still do it for you hallelujah 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 I'm almost done I, I, I feel like I can't get away from this Paul and Silas were cast into prison how many remember that story Paul and Silas were thrown not just into prison, but into the deepest part of the prison. And not only that, their hands and their feet were put in stocks, which meant they couldn't lift their hands in worship. See, we take these things for granted, don't we? We come to church, we have freedom, and we can run and shout, but we don't always take advantage of that freedom, do we? But Paul and Silas could not lift their hands they couldn't lift their feet they couldn't run an aisle but they forgot to gag their mouth <laughs> if you really really want to keep a christian down 
you better remember to gag their mouth. No, they didn't put any, anything over their mouth. And so they looked at one another. They were discouraged. They had been beaten. They were bloody. They were sore. All they'd been doing is preaching the gospel. And all of a sudden, we don't even know which one said to do it first. We don't know if it was Paul or Silas, but they made up their mind. Hey, I, I think that we should just start singing. <laughs> Maybe we should just start singing. Even when I don't feel it, he's working. I don't know what they sang. They might have sang that. Even, even if I don't see him, he's working. We don't know what they sang. They could have sang anything. They just started singing something. And they started singing praises to God as loud as they could. So much so that the rest of the prison heard them. And God sent a supernatural earthquake into that prison and loosed them of their bands. And all of a sudden they stood up and they just kept on praising. And everybody else in the prison, all of a sudden their bands were loosed and their prison doors were open. And so Paul and Silas just went through the prison praising God. And the jailer was there. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. And the jailer was there. He had he had charge over the prison, and it was his job to keep everyone where they were supposed to be. And you need to understand the Roman culture. If any of those prisoners would have escaped, that jailer would have been executed by the Roman government. And so he realized all these doors are open. These prisoners could all escape right now. If that happens, it's going to be bad. So he was about to commit suicide. See, we skip this part because we get so excited about how everybody's bands were loosed. And the Bible says he was about to fall on his own sword in shame. And Paul got an anointing from God and said, sir, don't you dare do that. We're all here. Nobody's going anywhere. But let me tell you a little something about Jesus. Somebody needs to go and tell John today. John's on the verge of suicide. John feels like throwing in the towel. John feels like giving up. But don't you do it, John. Let me tell you a little something about Jesus. How he can save you. How he can deliver you. How he can give you a brand new heart. How he can give you a new purpose. Musicians, get ready. I'm closing. Stand with me. Stand with me all across the building. And this is hard because I feel like the Lord wants me to do something, and I know we're in COVID, and so we're going to do it very, very carefully. But this is what I feel in the Holy Ghost. I feel like a few of us need to have the spirit of those two disciples who went from John to Jesus and from Jesus to John. And I know we probably shouldn't be touching each other right now, but if you could, we're going to pray, and then I'm going to give you an opportunity. And I want to give you the opportunity to go encourage somebody and walk down to the altar with them and pray for one another. Because I believe that what we need right now, I feel it in the Holy Ghost, is we need a disciple to tell us that everything is going to be okay. We need a disciple to encourage us in the Holy Ghost and say, we're in this together. We're going to make it. Jesus is still doing great things. Jesus is still able to move. But we need the Spirit. See, one of the dangers of COVID, and I, we've, been, we've been careful. We wear masks. That's good. And we've been social distancing. And we've been marching to give. And we've been doing everything that we can not to touch one another. But we need to remember that it still takes the body of Christ encouraging one another and saying, we are going to make it. Someone here today is on the verge of giving up. more than one and you wouldn't know it to look at them it might even be someone that you respect tremendously can you imagine how hard it would be to hear John the Baptist say I'm discouraged can you imagine how hard it would be to be a follower of John's and him saying 
I don't know, maybe my life was a waste. Maybe everything I did, maybe I really was just a crazy lunatic out in the wilderness eating locusts and honey. But they loved him enough that they didn't give up and they encouraged him in the Lord. We need that spirit. We can't lose that spirit because people need us to encourage them in the Holy Ghost. I want to pray for you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If I was preaching to you today, if you're discouraged, I know what the enemy's trying to do. He's trying to bring condemnation to you. And he's trying to make you feel ashamed because you're discouraged. Do not let him do that to you. The devil has no right to discourage you any further because the Lord wants to encourage you today. If you're here today and you're not discouraged, I want you to be praying that the Lord would use you to encourage someone in these next few moments. And I want you to pray that sincerely. So we're doing a dual prayer right now. I'm praying for the discouraged and I'm praying for some encouragers to have a Holy Ghost boldness unleashed in them. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, in the name of Jesus, right now I pray for some individuals who stepped into the house of God. And you wouldn't look at them and think it, Lord, but they're discouraged today. They're weary and well-doing. They're tired. They're questioning things. And Lord, I pray that you would confirm your power to them in this altar. I pray that you would raise up encouragers in the Holy Ghost today. People who are sensitive, who would reach out to a brother and sister in the Lord and remind them that everything is going to be okay, that God really does have all things working together for their good. I pray that you would bind us together as the body of Christ, as people who love you, that we would lift one another up even in our darkest, most difficult hours. And I ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. This altar is open. I wish an encourager would just reach over to somebody and say, would you come pray with me? Let the Lord lead you. Let the Lord lead you. Let the Lord lead you. Would you come pray with me? I, I want to pray with you. I want to encourage you in the Lord this morning. Come on, get a hold of somebody. Get a hold of somebody. Say, I want to pray with you in the Holy Ghost this morning. Be an encourager. Somebody go tell John, we're going to make it. We're going to make it till Jesus comes. Let the Holy Ghost lead you. Let the Holy Ghost guide you. I see you working. Let the Holy Ghost lead you. When I don't feel you working, you never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. Come on, we don't even know their names, but they might have saved John's life. Even when I don't we don't even know their names, but they lifted the greatest prophet up who ever lived in his darkest hour. God wants to use you to encourage a prophet today. God wants to use you to encourage a preacher today. God wants to use you to encourage a prayer warrior today. Even when I don't feel you again, you never stop, you never stop working. That's it, that's it, that's it. Stop, you never stop working. Even when I God wants to break the chains of discouragement this morning. God wants to break the bondage of fear this morning. You never stop. Yes, 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 yes. The Lord's still moving. The Lord's still moving. Reach over and pray for somebody. Pray for him, pray for him, pray for him. Pray for him, pray for him. You're making the difference. Your prayer's making the difference. Your prayer's breaking through the darkness. 
Your prayer is reaching through the prison cell. Your prayer is reaching past the fog of depression. It's reaching past the pain.
miracle worker, way maker, 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 miracle worker. Now, we're not dismissed yet, but we didn't mean to mention that the Lord's closet is opening for the last time today. So it's very important if you want to get in there. It's uh, free items that we collect and you can take them home. Uh, also, the ladies conference begins Friday. It's online, but Sister French is going to live stream it on our live large screens here Friday night and Saturday at nine o'clock. There's a, a little... Uh, what are they calling it? Um, what are you calling it? Refreshments. Coffee and refreshments. Brethren, do not show up. They will not let you in. It's for the ladies. No refreshments for you either. And so remember that. One more time. Light in the darkness. you to pray as long as you'd like but for those that need to be dismissed I'm gonna pray a prayer of dismissal Lord I pray that we would receive this word in our hearts that we take it home with us I pray you'd bring us back to prayer on Tuesday night I pray that you would bring us back to Bible study on Wednesday night keep us throughout the week I pray we love you and worship you in Jesus name and everyone said in Jesus name in Jesus name if you need to be dismissed you're dismissed Stay and pray in the altar as long as you'd like. We're not closing the altars.